So it's the sequel to Blade Runner, and because of how much Blade Runner means to people, myself included, I'm going to tread very carefully, and I'm going to talk very, very little about the plot. I know many people have seen the film yesterday, but I also understand that it's one of those things that... You know, you you don't want to have it spoiled. I will attempt to dis- to discuss it without discussing plot points, other than very very basic. You're going to talk around it. Is that what you're going to? No, I'll, I'll give you the basic setup, and then I'll talk about the film. So, thirty years after the events of the first film, in which you know Harrison Ford, Har- Harrison Ford's Deckard, this is talking about things that are in the first film. Incidentally, I think not, that's fine. That's fair. Okay, so Harrison Ford's Deckard, um, you that's know, his, the name of his character. Deck, yes, that's right. Ran off into the the sunset with it, Rachel Sean Young's character. And incidentally, if you're w- wondering which version of the film you should be seeing before we see this, definitely the final cut. That's the what. Well, I have a feeling I've just ordered the director's cut. Okay, the final cut's slightly... But it's, 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 it's close enough. It's close it? enough. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. What am I going to miss out on? Well, it's just that the final cut's got all the little problems, like how many androids, all that sort of stuff solved. And uh, anyway, but... Okay, so um, in the future, the Tyrell Corporation has gone bankrupt, now replaced by Neander Wallace's even more sinister corporation. Ryan Gosling is Kay, um, whose job it is to track down rogue androids. And in an early sequence, he tracks down a character played by Dave Bautista Sapper Morton, who tells him that the only reason he's able to do his job is because he's never seen a miracle. Here's a clip. Plan on taking me in. Well, take a look inside. Mr. Morton, if taking you in is an option... I would much prefer that to the alternative. I'm sure you knew it would be someone in time. I'm sorry it had to be me. Good as any. Now, if you don't mind, if you could just look up and to the left, please. So Kay lives at home with his virtual girlfriend Joy, who is who seems almost real, although she is basically a holographic projection. He's been doing his job and he's been getting by doing it. And one of the reasons he can is, as he says, you know, I never retired anything that was born. You know, to be born means to have a soul. And uh, although his superior says, yeah, you don't need one of them in this job. And but he's starting to have doubts about his job, his life, his purpose. And that's as much as I will say about the plot, other than to say that. The what Blade Runner 2049 then does is to follow a narrative which absolutely pursues the existential identity crises of the original, asking all those big questions. What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to have memories? How much do memories inform our past and our future? What does the slogan more human than human, which appears in the first film, actually really mean? The first film had an extraordinary, in all its versions, incidentally, because the, when the film was first released, it was not a hit. When Blade Runner was first released, it was not a hit. It was compromised after test screenings. They messed around with it. They messed around with the ending. And it's now we now have the film that Ridley Scott originally wanted. But in all the different versions, it had a, a sense of visual grandeur, of, of awe, that was quite breathtaking, particularly seeing the film back then at a time when science fiction hadn't looked like that. And it's true that every single film since Blade Runner, science fiction film since Blade Runner, kind of ended up looking like a post-Blade Runner film. I think in Blade Runner 2049, which is directed by Denis Villeneuve, who did such a brilliant job with Arrival, that sense of visual awe is back again. I mean, hats off to Roger Deakins, who is an extraordinary cinematographer. The worldview is breathtaking from these sort of grey vistas of bleak uh, cityscapes, the rusty coloured industrial wreckage, a kind of eco-collapsed world. The lighting is like a a version of, you know, the cabinet of Dr Caligari, all expressionist shadows and angular lines broken by reflections of water. And just on the on the sheer visual sense of the film you you just sit there and you you marvel at it in the same way that one marveled at Blade Runner when it first came out I mean I remember first seeing Blade Runner when you first see the cityscape when you first see the the fires bursting when you first see the pyramids you know just that sense of going (gasps) and there are moments in Blade Runner 2049 in which you get exactly that sense of you know overwhelming uh or once again, also the score, which kind of goes from these really 
strange industrial growls and noises and then rising to something which is almost like ligaty in its sort of sort of strange choral uh, cosmic revelations but dancing around the memories of the themes of the Vangelis score, which always seem to be sort of lurking in the background. Half an hour into the film, I literally made, I went, <sighs> and I realised that what it was, was the sense of relief that the film was, ab was about to do this properly. So that's now, a happy side rather yeah. than a worried side. I've now seen Blade Runner twice. I saw it first last week and that we were told afterwards that we were allowed to tweet about it, but not to... Uh, write reviews and um, then they lifted the embargo but I didn't want to say anything about it because I wanted to let it settle down then I saw it again this week about half an hour in I heaved this sigh of relief and it was partly to do with the pace it was partly to do with the fact that the film had the confidence to go okay we're dealing with fairly big subjects here and we, we're going to we're going to take them at this pace. The editing pace is there's an there's a, an exercise which film students do sometimes, which is that you show a, a piece of film and you clap every time there's an edit. OK, and if you watch an older film, it'll be like this, you know, and if you watch a modern film, it, it's like that. The editing pace of Blade Runner 2049 is so completely at odds with the pace of most sort of modern blockbusters that it's it's you know it's almost like a film from the 1970s in terms of the way in which it has that beautiful pacing. Um, there are many movies that it you know refers to. I mean, people have, have flagged up you know connections to things like The Shining and you know I saw bits of Angel Heart and you know films from lots and lots of different genres. But it is very much its own movie, and it is it has the confidence to be its own movie. But the greatest achievement of it, despite all the things that are visually ravishing, despite the the real the really beautiful details, like the fact that the you know the kind of the candy colours that you get from the artificial light are in such stark contrast to the natural colour of this world, which is as I said, you know, eco collapsed. The real joy of it is that the you know the screen is the, the screenplay is co-written by Hampton Fancher, who wrote the original screenplay, which was then rewritten by David Webb Peebles, which was then rewritten by Hampton Fancher. When we made the documentary on the Edge of Blade Runner, you just, just take me through that again, because so so basically, Philip K. Dick wrote "Do Androids Dream yes. of Electric Sheep?" Hampton Fancher wrote a screenplay based on "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" Uh, he then worked with that with Ridley for many many months, long process. Ridley then felt at some point that he needed to get in another writer to help with the city speak. He then brought in David, where people's um, Hampton Fancher was not pleased about it initially, and this is all in the documentary that I made. But then there was a rewrite that happened, and then the rewrite came back to Hampton Fancher, and they both then ended up sort of, you know, although they wrote, worked separately, they rewrote each other's script. And when we when we made that documentary, we interviewed the two of them together, and it was lovely because they had sort of worked in isolation beforehand, and they were discussing you know, who wrote what, and to the point that they couldn't remember who's, whose idea came from which, and, you know, they really became a, a sort of synthesis of the two of them. But Hampton Fancher um, is, you know, the sort of lead writer uh, on this, and it, what he's done is, what the, there's two screenwriters in my green, what they've done is they've managed to absolutely make Blade Runner 2049 about all the things that Blade Runner was really about. I mean, yes, it was about spectacle. Yes, it was about the dystopian future. Yes, it was about imagining this world. Yes, it was about that idea of, you know, the kind of the idea of San Angeles, the, the city that goes on forever. But it was actually about something much more fundamental, something which movies like AI, to which I think there are references, have picked up, you know, in the aftermath of Blade Runner. And like Inception, it's a film that imagines that the audience is smart enough and engaged enough and involved enough and intelligent enough and enthusiastic enough to go, OK, I will go with this and I will go with this at this pace. And mo most importantly of all, it felt like a film which was made with an absolute love and respect for the original, but also the bravery to go somewhere else. I did an on stage with uh, Ridley Scott and Denis Villeneuve before I had seen Blade Runner 2049 when they were showing an IMAX presentation of Blade Runner. And at the end of it, they were going to show 10 minutes of 2049, which I didn't want to see because I wanted to see the whole film. And there was a lovely uh, discussion between the two of them. I mean, as anyone who knows Blade Runner will know, there is a central enigma in Blade Runner about the nature of Decker, the nature of the central character. And what's really lovely is that although... What do you mean by the nature? Well, I, I don't... 
Okay, but, but, well, I mean exactly that. That's as much as I'm going to say. I know it sounds really ridiculous to talk about plot spoilers when you're talking about a film that is that old, but the, the central character of Deckard, his nature, like what he is, what he, you know, what his true nature is, is, is an enigma in, this, in the original film. Ridley Scott is very clear about how it actually works out. He says, no, no, this is what he is. He is this thing. And Denis Villeneuve says, well, actually, maybe, but maybe he isn't. And people have now, to this day, battle. I mean, you know, there was an interview recently in which Ridley Scott and uh, Harrison Ford were arguing about the fact that they never quite agreed as to what Deckard was. In fact, when I did that, when I did Blade Runner 2049, we got Hampton Fancher and uh, and David Webby was together and we said, OK, who first came up with the idea that Deckard may not be what you expect? And, do you have to speak in this riddle when it's 30 years ago? You know what? I'm just trying to tread very, very carefully. But anyway, it doesn't matter. What matters is this, that there is an enigma at the centre of the original Blade Runner. And what Blade Runner 2049 does is take that enigma, explore it, unpack it and preserve it all at the same time. It is a film which has absolutely the same key core concerns as the original film, but it also has its own vision of where to take those key core concerns that may or may not be in tune with how Ridley Scott reads Blade Runner. It is a film of quite breathtaking visual beauty, but more importantly, and I almost feel like weeping when I say this, it is a film that not only doesn't let Blade Runner down, but makes you feel like that dedication that you had to it for all those years is shared by the person that made this film. I mean, the second time round, I just, I literally just sat there and went, wow. You didn't weep. I, you know, without wish, wishing to refer to, you know, Rutger Hauer's final speech, I kind of did a little bit, but more out of relief and, and joy and just because if you're a genre fan and if you if you love science fiction and if you love the world building science fiction that Ridley Scott was doing with Blade Runner it's just great to see a film that goes you know what I love that too and actually here's the key thing if you saw Arrival and you know how Denis Villeneuve approached the idea of science fiction in Arrival he just did it again but with a Blade Runner sequel <laughs> 